talk in collaboration with the people that are on the slide and some of these people here in the store. So if you have questions, interrupt me at any time. And uh, um, if I don't know the answer, fine. Somebody else in this room is most likely going to have an answer. All right, so the talk today is about um, what I'm going to try to teach you to is an introductory talk on LLVM. So if you never use the compiler or never wrote an optimization in the LLVM compiler, this talk is going to have to write the first loop optimization. I mean, in particular, it's not about, it's about writing a high level loop optimization in the part of the compiler which is known as font. So the LLVM compiler has a front end, it has a low level back end, and something higher level back end that does transformation, such as with transformation data flow. Uh, before we get into that, we're going to introduce some terminology that we use in, uh, to describe the structure of groups. And then uh, we're going to do a little bit of an overview of the optimization, the loop optimization that are already available in LDM. Um, and then I'm going to have a demo. Uh, the demo is divided into five sections. We're going to start to write the loop optimization from the ground up until completion and then run it as we so um, here is, uh, so if you have a for loop over here, uh, and you dump the LLVM IR that is produced by the client front end, uh, the LLVM IR of the loop is going to be as such. It, there is a structure in this IR, so there is a block of code here that dominates the header of the loop that's called the pre-header. The pre-header is often empty, but it's a place where it's useful to have because if you want to put some code that need to be executed if the loop is, is executed, like you want to move code from the loop to the pre header, then the loop here. The header is, uh, is the block that dominates every other block inside the loop. The body is here, is dominated by the header. The header might have a branch that determines whether you continue to do the next loop iteration or you exit from the loop and you get out. If you don't do the loop iteration, you're going to get out of a block, which is called the exit block. And uh, the block that can exit to the exit block is called the exiting block. So in this guy, the header is also an exiting block because you may exit to the exit block. You may have more than one exiting block in a loop. And each one of these exiting blocks may exit to a different exit block. And there are some utilities in, in LLVM to retrieve each one of these blocks. If you want to get the pre-header, there is some uh, API that gives you the pre-header. There is some API that gives you the exit block. You can do, there are API that will tell you whether there is one exit block and one exit block or more than one. And finally, the last block that I'm here is the latch. The latch is essentially the block that has a back edge back into the header. So it goes back into the header, and that's how we recognize that this is our So that's the generic loop structure in LLVM, a little bit of terminology. And then there is some other terminology which I will not explain into uh, much detail. Uh, you know, you have a predecessor of a loop. Uh, you have a particular uh, thing called loop guard. Uh, a loop may be guard in the sense that if the compiler cannot determine that the loop will be executed at least once, he has to insert a check. And the check, if true, we are going to execute the loop, otherwise you're just, you're just going to skip around. It's called the loop down. It's a new concept in, in an LDN that we have introduced, uh, I think, last year or this year. And now there are a utility in the loop info, such an LDN to actually get the, uh, to answer whether the loop is guarded or not, and give it the loop guard. And uh, during the summer, uh, a number of people have started to try to put this information into a document. This is the document that, that is still work in progress, but essentially explains a lot of the loop terminology, uh, what's an iteration count, and a lot of the things that, have, that, that are needed to understand the loop structure. Um, there is a number of passes in LDM. A pass is a transformation that modifies the code that are what they call canonicalization passes. That they place loops into a canonical form. So one of these is the loop rotation pass. Assume that you have a game, a simple for loop. Uh, like we saw before, we have a header and the, the, the condition, the 
that determines whether you execute the loop is in the end, the, the example that I, that I gave you before. Well, that's not the canonical form. The canonical form in the LRDM is, uh, looks more like a two-wide loop, where you get immediately to the other, and then the, the, the condition, the, the latch condition, is actually at the end of the loop. So this loop will execute at least once. Now, that loop is not guarded because the compiler could prove, presumably, that the loop is executed at least once. Uh, this would be legal, illegal code if, if, for example, you receive the loop upper bound from uh, <coughs> a parameter into a function, and the upper bound is not known at compile time, then we would have to add a guard into, into this uh, into structure. So, if you start from the front end, I believe, the client front end will generate this form, and then the loop um, uh, rotation pass will transform the one loop into a one loop. Okay. Uh, okay, so it will also insert a loop epilogue. And I said that if it's guard, it will put a guard. Right, so the, you know, the complete structure is this. If this would be the guard of a guarded loop, that would be the pre of the of the loop is also canonical, and then there is a exit block over here and the notch. Sorry, the notch is this one. This is the exit block. So often you're going to see that formula here, yeah. um, and that's called a simplified form. As a, a loop will have a preheader. See if it's simply simplified form is that uh, will have a preheader, a latch, and it will have a dedicated exit. terminology about what's available in LDM. So we have analysis passes, and the difference between an analysis pass and a transformation pass is that the, an analysis pass is not allowed to modify the LDMIR. We can only uh, analyze the LDMIR and then uh, provide some the result of the analysis, but it's not allowed to change the IR. So there is a lot of uh, analysis pass in LDM. The, this one is particularly important for loop because it runs, it determines, it find out which loop you have in a function, uh, it, will, uh, it, will, uh, it, will, it will find out you know, what's the branch, and what's the canonical structure, and so on. Uh, and there is a, a number of other um, uh, transformation, where loop access analysis will analyze the access inside the loop to find out what's the structure of the, of the thing. There is a, a number of utilities, utilities that can be used by loop passes to do that work. Uh, for example, loop versioning. So if you want to uh, transform a loop, uh, but depending on a runtime condition, then you may want to create two versions of the loop, one for which the runtime condition is valid, is true, and the other one uh, that you want to execute in case the condition is not valid, it's false. And this utility will take a loop and version, so create two versions of it. Uh, and then the canonicalization pass that I just uh, explained. I'm not gonna go into too many details here. For all of them. Okay. Who knows what uh, LCS is saying out here? This stands for loop close for SSA. Okay. So that's a transformation that um, I don't have it in this slide because uh, so essentially if you have a variable that is live out of a loop, so in you say that you have a variable that you store inside a loop and then you use the value of that variable outside when you exit from the loop in multiple places. That means that there will be one definition and multiple uses. That still has the same form, right? You one, one reaching definition for every use. So that kind of structure, it's not canonical in LLVM. What, what we do in LLVM is to create a file node uh, in, at the exit of the, of the loop and then define that fine node based on the value that is defined inside the loop. So that if you ever modify that variable inside the loop, you have only one use out of the loop for that variable. And then everything else is going to be uh, defined in terms of the CCC fine uh, node. That's useful because it says compound time. Perfect. Question. Question. So loop with multiple uh, exit blocks that uh, have uses of variables cannot be 
in uh, so if you have multiple exit blocks you would have to put one exit blocks that post dominate each one of these exit blocks to find the object as a final side there. No, that's not right. It won't be because an LCSSA, I, I guess you could do it, but then you may have a value that comes from different blocks. So you have a final that says if I come from this block, this is the value. If I come from this other block, same value and so on. So you can still put into a form that I never, I never checked if they, the compiler can transform that particular situation and create the LCSSA, LCSSA form or not. What I'm saying is that I think it's possible to do. Uh, I think I think the reason is that when you update the uh, uh, the in internal in, in, uh, update some variable in the instruction, you want to propagate all of the instruction, and because it is in LC SSA form, then you all, all you need to do is to update the file and add it. Yeah, that's it. So well, that's you don't it. Have to find exactly. that you use. Otherwise, you basically have different. The variable will be using different parts of the code, and then you have to find the logic to go infinite ways to update it. So I also heard that another way that it's also useful if you wanted to parallelize the optimization of different loops, and there was a variable that was defined, it, then you, they would not conflict with each other, be able to parallelize yeah. the optimization of this loop and this other loop in the same fashion yeah. more easy. Although I love the doesn't do that. Parallelize the compilation, the optimization of different. No, I don't think so. Anyway, so there is a lot more, lot, lot harder transformation passes in, in LVM. Some of them are enabled by default, and some of them are not. So, for example, I'm familiar with this uh, particular loop, loop uh, distribution that's not in the loop pipeline by default. There's an option here. You can use an option, say, okay, enable loop distribution, and then it will run loop distribution. But by default, you don't get it if you don't use it. Uh, I think loop fusion is the same kind of thing. So some of them are actually not, they are there, but they are not running by default. So if you want to run them, there is usually an option that allows you to enable. Yes. Sorry. In the previous slide, you said irreducible loops not described. Is that do you find them? Utilities, which one? Sorry? Irreducible loop. Yeah, so this one. Um, so, yeah, so they will not, I don't think that they consider irreducible loops. Like this, this structure here will be for uh, canonical loop structures. The question then becomes what happens if you have an irreducible loop? So I don't think that will be represented inside the, uh, it will not be recognized as a loop. Right? It will, it will, if you ask how many loops do you have in this function, it, it will skip over the loops. That's my guess. It will find only the loops that are used to them. OK, so then there's a little bit of um, Sometimes the confusion between uh, when to use, in LLVM there are different type of transformation passes that operate on different uh, contexts. So you can have a function pass which uh, analyzes or modifies an entire function. There's also a loop pass. And the idea of a loop pass is that you're going to run it on a loop. Uh, and that's the scope of the transformation. So uh, in general, um, if, if you have, uh, this one would be a uh, function pass. You can see that it takes a function, there's a function analysis matrix, so that, that makes it a function pass. So if you have a function pass, usually, normally it's much more easy to implement a function pass over a loop pass, because one of the rules for loop passes is that uh, your loop transformation, it's responsible for maintaining all the auxiliary data structure that passes you. So, for example, if you have a dominator tree and you modify the dominator tree and you have a loop pass, you need to maintain the dominator tree up to date manually. So, but if you have a function pass, you can say I'm invalidating this analysis and 
then before the next functional pass run, if that functional pass requires the dominant tree, then the infrastructure is going to recompute the dominant tree. Right? So that is the one of the main difference between loop passes and, and functional passes. Now, there are some loop transformation that need to be functional passes, for example, uh, or are that need to be functional passes. If you have loop distribution where you split two loops into, then that's, I think technically it doesn't have to be a functional pass, but essentially I see it more as a functional pass. One of the recommendations that we have uh, for a lot of people is to just use a functional pass to start because much is All right, yeah, so it's better maintained. There's a lot of pass now at the end that are already functional pass, so it's, it's better maintained. You don't need to have a pass manager. Uh, you do not, that's a very important one, you do not need to preserve all of this, which is cumbersome and it requires time, it's error prone. But you know, if you have, what's the, what are the reasons to write a loop pass? You can, you can apply multiple passes in the same loop before processing the entire nest. So if you have a loop nest, you're gonna go from the innermost to the outermost loop, so you're gonna apply all the passes to the innermost loop before you apply a pass to the next loop, right? So if you, for, for some reason, you want to apply a lot of passes to the inner loop before you process the outer loop, then loop passes gives you that ability. All right. So that was the first part, you know, a little bit about the terminology and a very quick and brief high level overview of the, of the uh, passes in RDM okay, and some of them. Now, the next part of this is going to be more hands on for me, not for you guys. You can sit there and, and watch. <laughs> and so, what we have done in this, in this tutorial, we have created a, a GitHub project where we're going to take a, a simple transformation and try to write it from the ground up. The transformation doesn't do it's just for education, it's, it's a toy example. So what we're gonna do is assume that you have a loop and we want to split the loop somewhere. Right? So if you have a loop from one to n, uh, zero to n, you wanna split it in. You choose a split point and split the loop at that point to create two loops. That may be useful, for example, if you wanna peel some iteration from that loop because you wanna fuse that loop with another loop. So, so it's more like IoT. The goal here is not to claim that this is useful, it's just to teach uh, how to write a simple transformation. A little bit, the steps that you can go through to do that. So the first step is gonna be, uh, we're gonna just create a very simple template, a loop optimization template. We're gonna only talk about one pass manager. In LRDM op, there are two pass managers, what they call the new pass manager, which has been around for years, so it's not so new anymore. And the legacy pass manager, which is the default pass manager. We're gonna talk about the new pass manager because eventually the new pass manager is gonna be the only pass manager that is gonna be uh, yeah. right. So if later on you want to go and uh, Take a look at the uh, tutorial. It's uh, I added the slides, so all that I don't know if you have it over here. There is the URL for each one of these uh, steps, so you can go over there and look it offline later on. So the first step is um, we want to write a loop of uh, The seven files that are brand new. The first one is the error file. Can you can you guys see? So in the error file we have a class called loop split. Loop split as a constructor and a run method, which is going to do essentially all the work of this transformation. Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> okay, this class is gonna is gonna receive an object loop info. Remember that loop uh, info analysis that I talked about. This is essentially what this is. Once you have a loop info, you can ask question: What's my car? Uh, what's my lunch? What's my end of And uh, so this loop split is gonna be the class that does all the work. And we need to actually declare it as a pass. So we're going to say we have a loop optimization tutorial pass, which is then going to use loop split to do this work. The loop optimization tutorial pass is a run method, which takes a loop, and it will go and try to optimize it. And uh, uh, that's all you need to do to uh, create a loop pass. Then you have to add it to the pass builder. So the pass builder is the place where we create the, the optimization pipeline. So when you have the pass builder, say the first thing that you run is this transformation, then this one, then this one, and this one. So we're going to need to add a pass, our own pass, the loop optimization tutorial pass that, that we have declared over here, to the pipeline at some point in the pipeline. It doesn't really matter what, what we add. And then we have to register the pass. So uh, all the loop passes are gonna have a macro for loop pass. And this is gonna be the short name of your pass. So on the command line, you can say dash loop op tutorial, and it's gonna run that pass. Okay. Get it to the main file. So we need to compile it, and this is gonna be the implementation of the pass. Uh, so remember, we have a class, we have to define the run method. And we also have to define the run method for the, for, for the class itself. So when we arrive over here, the first thing that we do, we're going to meet some debug messages. This is the way that you meet a very simple. There's a macro called an empty bug, where you can put, uh, you know, like you print your message, and whenever you say dash debug only, equal the short name of my transformation, that line is going to come out and print. So we have a couple of traces here. We're going to build our transformation. So we need a loop info object. So we're going to initialize that and then run the transformation on our loop. All right. Now, this is going to return whether the code was changed or not. If there was nothing to do, we're free to preserve all the analysis. We do not, by default, if you don't preserve the analysis, all of them gets invalidated. So you're responsible for if my pass didn't do anything, then I need to preserve the analysis because I don't want to invalidate all the analysis so they get recomputed and this is not And uh, if not, then you're gonna get done. That's uh, that's all there is. One thing is if you ever upstream any code to the LLVM community, for each piece of code that you upstream or nearly every piece of code that you think you need a test case. And the test cases are actually IR to IR. So you don't really upstream you know, a piece of C++ at least for LRDM out. Your input language is LRDM IR, and your transformation will modify the IR, and then you have to check that that transformation does what you need to do. So in this case, I have a, I have a dot LR file. This, this means that I have an LRDM IR file, where I have my IR, that's my LRDM IR. So I have a loop over here. And then I have another loop at the end. And essentially, I want to check if my transformation can print these two lines. Did I find the loop correctly? And if I find the loop correctly, I can dump it. And we're going to see the loop structure. So let's do and run and test this. Some messages that you 
So if I run this on my simple ML, oh sorry. Okay. Okay, so you see that we got we found a loop, but that one it contains a header and then it also gets the block with a latch, so then we printed that we found that loop and then another loop here. And I want to add, if, in fact, add two loops. If one loop was here, the BB5, that's the other because BB14 has a branch back to BB5, so it's a back edge. And that's all. all right, so nothing more, not, nothing very interesting. So that's so we have a functioning loop pass that's been registered, but it doesn't do anything. So now the next step is to try to add something, make it do something. So the, f the thing that we want to do here as a second step. <clears throat> so one of the things that we need to do is to select which loops we are interested in transform, change. Often a transformation can ignore some loops. For example, a loop may not be in canonical form, it may have a uh, function call with side effects. There is a number of conditions that tells you I'm not prepared to transform this. So here we're going to check some of these conditions, and then we're going to filter out all the loops that we don't want to enter. And then we're left with only the loops that are structured correctly and we want to enter. So the difference between the previous uh, piece of code that I show you and this one is that now we have a candidate method. So we receive a loop and return true if we are prepared to transform this loop and enter. Otherwise, we are return false. And uh, uh, my run method is going to be modified to say, well, instead of printing this, I will check if it's a candidate. If it's not a candidate, I'll print that it's not a candidate. Otherwise, I'm going to just print that it's a candidate. So nothing too interesting. And here, we're going to start to use some of the loop uh, APIs. So there is an API that tells you if the loop is in that simplified form that most transformations are prepared for. Right? If it is not in that form for any reason, I don't want to, to, to look at it. Uh, we are going to be cloning loops because we need to take a loop and duplicate it. And there is some clones that are, for whatever reason, are not safe to clone. They, I not, I'm not sure what this function really does, but uh, we're going to avoid transforming them and so on. So this is usually a structure that you guys can think about when you write your optimization, try to write a function that is going to filter out error condition of things right, right at, the, at the beginning before you do something else. Also, this one is interesting. If, if we have a loop that contains a child, so there is an inner loop, we don't want to handle it because this is a toy transformation and we don't want to worry about it. All there is is what we want to So now we're going to go to. So I'm now on a step two. We still have the same IR. Okay, so actually we only have one book. and also it's going to trigger that uh, BB5, that's loop over here, it is a candidate for splitting because it satisfies all the conditions. It doesn't fail on any of the checks over here. It doesn't have an inner loop. Uh, it's in uh, it's simplified form. It's rotated. Everything is looks fine. So that's step two. Step three. So now that we have filtered um, the loops that we don't want to enter, the next step is to start to do some real work. So that we're going to want to clone the loop. We're going to take a loop and try to clone it and create two loops. Um, 
and then we're going to try to inject the clone loop after or before the, the previous loops. Then we're going to compute the split point, and then we have to change the upper bound of the first loop to be equal to the split point. So if you loop from 0 to 100, you split in half. The first loop is going to go from 0 to 50, and the second loop, lower bound, is going to start to 51 and go to 1. Okay, so we need to clone the loop, and we need to change the bound, which means uh, if there was a guard, we need to change the guards as well, uh, which means that we need to use some of the loop infrastructure to find the bounds and then change it. All right. Now you have a split point over here that 
is what we are going to here. We are going to insert the, the clone of the initial loop. So this is the initial loop. Then we are going to clone the loop and put it in. So now you see that we have cloned the loop and injected over here. And then the split point goes to the next loop. All right. And then uh, we need to remap the instructions. After we are all done, check if our IR looks fine. So this is the computation of the split point. So percent one is essentially 100 divided by two. All right, so we split enough. That's our split point. And the first loop is going to go from zero. What is the match? The match is here. It's going to check if we reach that split point. starts at the split point. So it's going to go from 50 to 100. So that looks correct, except that uh, if I were to verify this code, you will not, you will not, you, you get an assertion if you run the ELMP and verify it because you did not update the dominant loop. Next step is step four. show how to reflect the fact that we've changed the IR into the dominant or three data structure. Now, you could do this manually by going and picking up the dominant or three and then inserting new nodes and connecting the new nodes and so on. So there is a way to do that. But there is a better utility in our vehicle called dominant or three updater. And essentially, what this is the utility structure there. You can say, well, add this node, add an edge between this node, and it's not going to do it for you until you, 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 you put the update and then you tell it, apply all this update in one shot. Uh, that's one of the ways you can do it. You can do it both eagerly and basically. So here we're going to use this utility to, to do all the changes. All right, so the meat of this. So we're going to create a vector of updates, of three updates. A small vector is a data structure that is commonly used in the LVM to create a vector. Instead of using standard vector, LVM has its own faster uh, data structure. A small vector is a vector that is optimized to keep uh, a small value, uh, like an array of, of a few values. And in this case, we say we're going to, you know, it's going to be usually having eight of these updates. But it can grow if you have more than eight, it can then reallocate itself and you can use more of it. Uh, the dominator tree updater, uh, it takes a dominator tree that is modified and then an update strategy. In this case, say we're going to do it lazily, so give me all the updates and then when you tell me to apply them, I'm going to apply them lazily. I'm not going to apply them as soon as I was. So we're going to pass the three updater to our right home, loop with pre and then inside here. And then here, we're going to print out all the updates. So after we've cloned the loop, we're going to say, this is all the updates that we need to apply. And when you when you finally have collected all the updates, you have to call applied updates and flush it to get the final, to, to get the dominator tree to this final. Um, the dominator tree has some really handy routine to verify its own correctness. So dominator tree can verify itself. So that's something useful to have. If you change the code, you can always say dominator tree verify 
at some point, and this will, will give you an assert if it is invalid. Not only it's going to give you an assert, it's going to tell you why it is invalid. It's going to tell you the dominator tree looks like this right now, and it's not consistent with this. It's going to be computed from scratch, and then it's going to compare, say, you're going to be able to see the difference. This is the dominator tree that you have, and that's how it should look like. So then you can go in and try to fix it. Just forgot to add an edge or add a node or something like that. Um, the same thing happened to the loop info. This is another data structure. A lot of data structure now at the end of fundamental data structure have a verified method. So this one can also verify itself. To verify itself, it needs a dominator tree. So it's going to recompute the loop info and check that it's consistent. If it's not, you're going to get an You're going to get an assault. It's all called the variables. So let's take a look at our loads. Okay, run is the same thing. So we are, we are running the rotate pass, our own pass. We're going to print some information. That's how you get the debug traces, by the way. So you don't if you don't have this, your LRD and debug traces are going to be disabled, so you have to remember to put that option. the updates that you told me to do. I will insert an, an edge between this block and, and that block. So I'm going to delete this edge. So you can actually picture how the dominant tree is going to be updated. By looking at the code uh, and computing the dominant tree yourself, you can say, oh, that's, I did something wrong, or this is actually um, If you do not want to do that, then the assert is going to trigger anyway. Did something wrong the In this case, the assert doesn't fire, so I must have done it right. Okay. And this is particularly important, I think, because this is not like that you're going to run a program into it. You are just comparing, there is, you are modifying IR, and then you check in that the modifier IR is what you think it should be. But you are not actually running that program in twenty. So it, it's not that you know the program is going to set forward, it's not going to produce the correct result. It's up to you to write the, the lead test correctly. So having verifying some of these data structure is quite important. And you should always have some kind of verification method in your Last one. So we're essentially done. I think the last thing that I want to show you guys is uh, another utility. So sometimes in trans transformation, you want to know whether your transformation did anything. When you run hundreds of transformation, uh, you may want to emit a message for the user to say, my transformation failed because the analysis didn't, didn't run correctly. Or my transformation did modify the IR and I was able to to split five loops in my function, that sort of stuff. So that's usually done using this object called optimization remark emitter. It's a class in NLVM that allows you to log um, like record messages. And it can you know, allow you to, to, to log two different types of report messages. One is analysis that failed or succeeded, and the other one changes that you've done to the AR and, and fail or succeed. So we're going to do both in our in our okay. Let's see. All right, so you know you, you declare the optimization of remark emitter. We're also going to add a statistic class. The statistics class uh, can be involved by saying dash stats. Very useful because it's going to count how many times each transformation in LRVM modified the code. So you're going to say, I run this transformation, modify my code 1,000 times. It's not going to tell you in which function, but it's going to tell you how many times you run from that function. All right, 
so we have added uh, our optimization remarking meter so that we can use it. And we have two function, three function, one to report it. We found a loop that is not valid candidate for any reason. And we're going to log that into the statistic. Uh, we have done something correctly or we failed to transform correctly. So uh, these are the way to register a different kind of statistic that you want to collect in your pass. So because we have different way that our optimization can fail, we can collect every time that it fails for a particular reason. So in this case, if we found a loop that is not the innermost loop in the nest, then we don't want to handle that, we're going to register that and count how many times we need we find the condition. So instead of saying if it's a candidate, it's false, uh, we're going to uh, say, well, if we can split the loop, report a failure. The loop was not split, otherwise we will report a success that the loop was split. And whenever we check for a candidate, instead of simply returning false, we are going to call that function, which is going to take the loop, and then the reason why it failed. In this case, it didn't find the loop in simplified form, so it's going to emit that long that messages. That's all this batch is doing. And here is our, so you know, once we call report invalid candidate, we're going to increment that statistic that we are passing, and then we're going to emit a message. And in this case, we're going to emit an analysis message. The analysis message takes the a string, which is the name of your transformation, uh, the name of your statistic, the location in the code. It will emit a message say at this line number in the code there was this error condition. You know, I failed to analyze this loop. Um, and then your actual uh, string that you want to emit. The same thing with success. Now this is going to be an analysis remark because we were doing an analysis and we failed to find something that we were analyzing the code, we didn't find a condition that we like, so we failed the analysis. This is, when we do something correctly, we modify the code, it's a remark. So it's not that we log an analysis message, we log a transformation message, and we have to use a different type of message. Okay, and then the, when we report a failure, okay, we miss to run that particular organization. So let's take a look. So, so here is a remark, here is an example of a remark. We were able to transform a loop correctly. The loop was transformed in this function. That's the line number that is the column number. And this is the name of the function where it contains the loop, and that's your message. The loop has been split. And because we run our loop tutorial pass, and we were able to transform one loop in logs. So if you have 25 loops, it will show 25 over here. If you have 30 loops and five fail, it will tell you five of them were not transformed, and it's also going to record the reason why they were not transformed. So this is kind of useful, especially for you, for you know, not so much the end user, but the the, you as a developer, when you want to know if your code is working well on a large uh, benchmark or a large, large piece of code, you, you want to know, you're going to know, I, my transformation was able to find this many opportunities, and this one failed, this is why, and this is when. And so you can quickly go there and look in field, yes, it makes sense, or no, it's a bug in my pass, I need to fix it. Alright, that's um, that's all I have for the tutorial. If you guys have any more questions, you can ask now. Otherwise, that is it. Any questions? Yes. Uh, what is the difference between
actually clone this code and run it yourself. Yeah. Good question. Uh, just now you use the new path manager, right? And you are passing the, in the command line, you are passing the passes in both the texture yeah. string, which I tried to figure out the format. I couldn't find the reference anywhere. Yes, uh, I could have. Kind of so I was trying to figure that out myself. So what I did, I did crap and found out that many people who write LRPM IR file and then they use this pass. So I knew that I, I didn't know exactly how to use pass, so I just looked at other test in test and see yeah. how the people use this. But essentially this is how it works. Alright, so if you call opt uh, this is the command line option that you need to use to enable passes in the new pass manager, dash passes. And then um, there's a comma separated list of passes. And there are different types of passes. Some are loop passes, some are fashion passes. So here, because I want to run two loop passes, I'm going to say, say loop, and then these are the loop passes that I want to run. Rotate is a loop pass, so it's going to run, it, it's going to run that pass before my own. Why are you going to do it manually? Actually, in the pass uh, builder.dev file, you already defined it with the require for that pass. You and put you the string to as required. You have to do it manually. Yeah, I don't know if you if, So, what we is trying to say that perhaps you don't need this. No, I mean, this is needed because you want to have the ORE message up. Yes. And this string is defined in the Oh, this thing, okay, time. yes, this all remarks I mean, is already there. So I'm saying, okay, my pass requires a service of analysis, and that's something that I need to add. So I don't require. Yeah, but like what I'm saying is that uh, putting a power library and the require analysis. It doesn't seem to work, at least uh, for this one people are one. It does work for, for example, loop info, and other loop passes are already yeah. passed to a loop pass by default. This particular one is a function pass. Got it. So the, when, when you create a root pass, there is a number of analyses that are given to you by default. Yeah. This one is a function analysis or a function infrastructure. So I have to put it in because it, it's not given to me. But within the root pass, will depends on that function pass and it will be automatically. Is it? No. You cannot. I don't think that I say that I depend on it. It's the old pass manager. I like to say I depend on something. It's manager. Yeah, but, but the new pass manager, you just get the result, right? You don't have to. You don't have to like uh, yeah, you say you depends on that. We'll get the result automatically. Yeah, but if I mean, we can try right now to see if uh, okay. what's going on. I think all our needs just a special case. Get the So if I want to remove the domain, because the loop pipeline required. Yeah. Yeah. Not the pass required. Right. Oh, I see. So it's gonna tell. So I just removed that required. This is the message that I'm I have a function pass that you want, but I didn't run, so I don't have it cached. And the only way that I know how to force it run is that. Oh, because this is this is more like a it's not like a typical uh, or pass. Or because it's not a loop pass. It's, sorry, or it's not a loop analysis that comes with loop pass. It's a function analysis or a function thing, and it doesn't come with it. So that's how you, that's how you. So if you find this message, then require that thing to so force it to run. Yeah, because I was like uh, wondering why it don't. Uh, Dominant chip was not anything, yeah. but this one is special. Um, now you know. Usually you don't need to do this except in your own uh, unit tests, yeah. because when you run into a program, you would insert a pass in some part of the pipeline, and many other passes are likely to run before you. Some of them is most likely going to cause also into our, yeah. the optimization of market meter, so you don't have to actually. Yourself, yeah. but uh, if 
you are upright, you just contain that when you want, just run the minimum necessary for your bus to work for the new bus manager. Mm -hmm. this one. Yeah. I remember the old bus manager that I took the world and that's taken out. The other question is, can you, can the loop pass disable the invalidate the uh, function pass result, the dominant tree? Pass uh, can, can a loop pass can be served by the loop pass uh, loop analysis, but you cannot in theory you cannot use uh, you cannot use the use of function. Okay, but you can force. Well, while there is a lot of loop pass, they may want to use some function. 
explain where all the passes are run and also which one are enabled by default and disabled by default. So I, I recommend you to go and if you're interested, listen to the YouTube video because it tells you this is what happened at the beginning of the loop pipeline. That's what's in the middle. This is where vectorization is run and so on. Um, but you know it's fluid because we're actively working in you know adding new passes and so this pipeline is going to change over time. But that's a good starting point if you want to see what's there today. And if your interest is to look at what are the requirements for existing loop passes, like yeah. is it required to be just be simplified form or need to be rotated or need to be LCSSA? Someone in the loop group have took the initiative to create a table for that as well. Yes. So because uh, there is a little bit, there is inconsistency between loop passes. Some of them require loops to be rotated, some of them they don't. And some of them doesn't matter, we can handle both forms. But if you need to handle, usually if you can if you can rely on a particular IR form, then you don't have to worry about, oh, you know, I have to write my transformation for this and then again for that and then again for that. Because that's a long term, right? So you lie to say, well, this is my canonical form and I expect to receive this. If I don't get this, like I don't mind. Unless you have some there's people that don't like rotated loops because uh, uh, they add more code. They add a little bit more code into the into the AR and they are trying to optimize to reduce the amount of code. Like they, they, they go on embedded processors, so to them it's much more important that the code is small, and so they don't want you to rotate loops. But you know, most other people in the community they want to have rotated loops because they don't want to handle off cases. So there's always going to be some of these. Uh, and RBM is not just one architecture. It has to satisfy a very large and varied community. So it's very hard to come up with something that is perfect for everybody. That's all I can say. Thank you. Okay. Well,